to see you. Um, if you're with a loved one, give them a hug and a kiss. Grab a child, grab your spouse. If you're with a friend and if you're by yourself, hit us up on the chat and we'll love you great back. That's right. Listen, we love God. We love people. We love life. And we're here to celebrate love, celebrate the freedom, the goodness, the grace of Jesus Christ. Would you just join us as we continue to worship together? Love you.
situation today. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, Silence, fear, singing out Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Sing Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence. Through it's the new sermon series. And I just want to speak to any of you that are going through difficult times right now and you just believe and step forward into God's faith, into God's love, into His open arms to overcome that obstacle you're being faced with. So let us enter into this song and let us preach it and let us praise God with all of our hearts. I am weary from the 
washing over every day. God of mercy, please come rescue me. I am longing for your touch, gentle whisper in the noise. Father, tell me.
spoke a word you were singing over me and you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me and so the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God and so it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away and so the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God that wash over you today your phone steal your love from me you have been so so good to me when I felt no worth you paid it all for me you have been so so
one that says, I'm lovely, he says, you are lovely. To the one that says, I'm so not beautiful, he says, you're so, so beautiful. To the one who says, I'm not worthy, he says, you're more than worthy. And if it was just for you alone, I would have went to the cross. If they didn't even put nails in my hands, I would have held myself there just for you. Let that truth sink over you today. No matter how you feel, no matter what you've done, his love is reckless. It's never ending. And there's nowhere you can go to flee from it. Thank you, Jesus. We say thank you, Jesus. I'm the lead pastor at All Nations Church. We're so excited that you've joined us here this morning on this Valentine's Day. I'm excited because I think, uh, the, I don't know if the groundhog saw a shadow or not last week, but I'm believing spring is coming soon. How about you? We're excited about today. This is the second message in our series called Breakthrough. And we just believe that God is breaking through in, uh, in and around our world. And he's breaking through in people's lives as well. God is on the move, and for those that are open to him and welcoming him, he's doing mighty things. Would you agree with me this morning? Well, uh, last week we started talking about this whole concept of breakthrough, and we started with the history of, a little bit of a history of the kingdom of God breaking through in our world. And we went back through Israel's history a little bit, and we talked about, of course, Adam and Eve was created to walk with God in this kingdom fellowship, and long story short, they exercised their own will and fell away from God, and then were tied up in Egyptian captivity for over 400 years. It was a deep, dark time in Israel's history. And of course, they decided uh, that they they were just destitute and lost. But God came through supernaturally, breaking through by his Holy Spirit. And the God of all creation, Yahweh God, came and executed judgment on the gods of Egypt and set the Israelites free. So then we see Israel moving on and moving into their life and they walked through the wilderness for several years and finally set up camp in Jerusalem and they had Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple was called the golden age when God's reign and rule happened through the lives and through the people of Israel. And uh, we felt, we see that they were working with uh, God and they were yielding to God and there was great wisdom and great peace ruled and reigned in that era. <clears throat> well, what happened shortly thereafter, excuse me, what happened shortly thereafter was uh, Israel again followed their own ways and were taken into a long period of captivity. And such a time came that Israel was once again lost and needing a breakthrough. But there was always a promise from God that he was going to redeem his people. And that's what happened at the time of Christ. So Christ came. He was the manifestation of the word of God. And he manifested the kingdom of God in a personal way so that people could see him and watch him and learn how to walk in that kingdom experience. Last week, we talked about the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And we're going to continue in Matthew 5 today. But the Beatitudes, Beatitudes were talking about how blessed and how happy people would be and how fulfilled people would be when they walked the principles of the kingdom of God. And so that's kind of where we're picking uh, this up from today. God calls us ambassadors of his kingdom. He's called us out of the kingdom of darkness And scripture says he's translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That's who we are. And that's what we're talking about today. I want to start with a little story about 
when Kathy and I were young, you know, I've, my wife Kathy, I was going to have her come with me today, but I was afraid she might, you know, tell you some stories that I didn't really want out yet. So I decided to, you know, Kathy better stay at home. Anyways, you can catch up with her later. But I want to tell you the story when Kathy and I got engaged. So Kathy and I had known each other from McDonald's restaurant. We'd worked there for some time. And then I'd went away and started my career. And Kathy was still working at college. But long story short, we got together again. And after a very short period of dating, um, I decided it was time to get married. And it was like the end of October, we started dating. And, and this was the end of January. I had a ring all ready to give to my dear wife. And uh, so she kind of knew that that was coming. And we went away one night. We're having a nice time, had dinner and things like that. And when I started to hint to her that I had this ring and I was about to give it to her, Kathy freaked out. She didn't know what to do. She actually pretended that she was asleep and she dozed off and I tried to wake her up. I tried to tell her what was going on. And, uh, and she pretended she was asleep. She just freaked and she just kind of went in a coma. Well, you can imagine what that did for me. I'm saying, hey, hey, wake up. Are, are you okay? Uh, what's going on? She's just like, she's snoring, drooling. She was like out of it. She was scared to death. So needless to say, I was a little disappointed, a little frustrated, a little angry. So what I do, I get all in a huff and I went home and then uh, we got together again that week. And, uh, you know, she kind of lightened up a little bit and we kind of talked a little bit about that incident. It's kind of like, oh, uh, what happened? And she said, well, kinda, I'm kind of interested. I'm sorry. I freaked out. I was kind of afraid. And so that Friday night we went out for a date like normal and Peterborough had a beautiful zoo. And so you could go into the zoo and you could drive right up to where the monkeys were. So we sat really close to the monkey cage. And I was trying to be a nice romantic guy, have a nice romantic engagement, but my wife wouldn't have nothing to do with that. So I took her in front of the monkey cage and uh, we were sitting talking and kind of discussing the incident. And Kathy said, I, you know, I really want this. I really want this ring. And I said, look, it, it's in that glove compartment over there. If you can find it, you can have it. And Kathy went rummaging through there and she found the ring and we got engaged and the rest is history. Going on 38 years as of this May. So I'm thankful for what God is doing, what he's done in our life. But we got off to a rocky start. And we kind of got off to a rocky start because we were a little frightened. We, we were fear of rejection. We'd had some challenges in the relationships. We were, uh, marriages around us were not doing well and lots of divorce was happening around us. And so we loved each other, but we were afraid and I'm uncertain of how we would do in this marital relationship. We, we didn't know if we had what it takes to love well and to care well. And we didn't want to get into what we'd seen as so many dysfunctional relationships. And so I think our, our fear was well kind of uh, founded, but um, I knew that somehow God wanted us together and that he was going to do something great through us. So I don't know uh, about you, but Justin Bieber has that song intentions. And I, I know we can have all the right intentions, but if you don't have uh, an understanding of love and an understanding of relationships, you, does, you can have all the best intentions in the world, but you may not be successful in your love relationship. So that's what we're going to talk about today. As a church, our mission is to love God, love people and love ourselves, love the life we're living. And to do that, we need to know that how God loved and how God told us to love. And if we do that, we will be successful. What does it look like when it comes to matters of the heart? So we've all been created in the image of God and uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're in cooperation. They're in community. They're, they're in a love relationship with one another. We're made for this. That's our desire to be in human relationships, to love and to be loved. That's the deep heart of each and every one of us. And so we need to look at how to do that. We desire to love our children. We want to have a godly love for our children. We haven't always experienced a healthy love in our own families. And as a result, sometimes make mistakes with our children. We desire flourishing relationships no matter the stage of our life, whether we're single, whether we're dating, whether we're divorced, whether we're looking for another uh, partner. Uh, we want to do this right. And I want to tell you today that the Lord wants you to have a healthy relationship with him, with yourself, and with those around you. It's so important. Can you agree with me that we all need to do relationships better and we could use a little help? Well, that's what we're going to work on today. Breakthrough is about how we live in the kingdom of God on earth, how this supernatural kingdom of God extends into our relationships 
and into our everyday life. We need to learn to walk as Jesus walked and love as Jesus loved. This is our focus and attention for today. We're looking at a breakthrough and we're looking at a breakout, a new breakout of the love of God and the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. And we ask that today, supernatural by your Holy Spirit, you would move in the hearts of every person that hears this message. God, would you come and would you light our hearts up that we could see anything that is blocking and separating us from the love of God. God, you said there's no mountain you wouldn't climb up, no shadow you wouldn't light up coming after us. We pray, God, that you would light those things today. You would climb that mountain today. You would penetrate deep into the hearts of people where they're hurt, where they're broken, where they're struggling. Father God, and set people free. That's our prayer. That's what we're believing for now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I'm so excited by that. Worship was so powerful. It was full, and I could sense the presence of God. I could sense what some people have called a breaker anointing. And I just believe today that uh, if you listen to the word and you, you, you know, play this over again, God is going to shake something loose. Some area that you've been bound, some area that you've been struggling, God supernaturally is going to come in and move on your behalf today. I believe it in Jesus' name. So a breakthrough of God's kingdom is a breakthrough of God's love. It affects our motivation and our response, our, our present and our future, it affects everything. So we need this breakthrough of the kingdom of God, and we need this breakthrough and awareness of God's love because that's how faith works. Faith works by love, right? So when Jesus arrived on the earth, he re-emphasized this love for others. See, Deuteronomy 6 talked about the great commandment, which was people were to love God, love to God with all their strength, all their mind, all their heart. But Jesus came to earth and he introduced a new principle. He said that in Mark 12, 30, that you're going to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So Jesus was reintroducing this love for neighbor. See, in the Ten Commandments, the first five commandments were always focused on people loving God. The second five commandments were all focused on how we relate to other people. Thou shalt, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal. These were things related to your response to people. But Israel got into this, this law, this ritualistic behavior that they thought if they obeyed every one of these little rules, they would just uh, have this relationship with God and they would do well. But God said, you need to understand the spirit of the law as well as the letter of the law. So Jesus came to earth to reintroduce us to that. And that's what we're looking at today. So Jesus said, if you love like this, you are not far from the kingdom of God. God is saying, Jesus is saying, this is how we need to enter into the kingdom by loving, by caring for people other than ourselves. We need to recognize that we are born innately selfish. We are, usually live our lives uh, to serve ourselves. And uh, Jesus is constantly um, calling his followers to lay down your life and follow Christ and follow his ways. And so it's a challenge that God's giving to us right now to love the way he loved. Well, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm going to go through a couple of Greek words very quickly. Uh, agape is that love you've heard. It's that unconditional love. It's that selfless love that we see in a mother that is always attributed to the father, this agape love. Then we have this eros love, which is passionate. It's romantic. It's, it's, I just pray you get it if you're married, that you understand eros love and you have a good time with that. It's exotic. It's beautiful. It's powerful between a husband and wife. This philea love is a friendship love. It's just a love between you know, brothers, Jonathan and, and, and David had this friendship, right? There's pragma love, which is loyal. That's the, your golden retriever kind of love. You know, you could, you could forget to feed him. You could, uh, you know, forget to take him out for pee. You could forget to do a lot of things and he'll just keep loving you. That's that uh, pragma loyal love. And then there's the ludus or playful love. This, this, uh, my grandkids come over and we play all the time. We have lots of fun. The other day we introduced another game that the two girls, Belle and, and um, Adelaide, said, hey, we, they went and got their hair done. They had something done with their hair. I said, well, Grandpa knows how to do hair too. Grabbed a hold of them, put them up in the counter and took them over to that sink and just started pretending I was doing their hair. That's that playful love. God wants us to have this playful, not just 
uh, you know, stoic all the time, not just I love you. You know, I, I loved you when I married you. And if I ever uh, decide not to love you anymore, I'll let you know, you know, playful love that's enjoying one another. It's f- having fun. It's it's kibitzing and playing together. And then uh, 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 fellatia, which is uh, self-love. And we know that uh, there's a lot of focus on self-love or self-care now. And that's more of a selfish love. It's a love that's looking after yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need to look after ourselves. We need to care for ourselves. We need to balance what we're doing for others versus what we're doing for ourselves. When we talk about a love like this, when we talk about a message like this, we have to be careful because those people that are selfless always hear the one little word that you talk about, don't, don't be selfish, and they, they want to act on that. But no, don't receive any guilt or any pressure today. God wants you to care for yourself, and he also wants us to love unconditionally other people. So we need to look at uh, what motivates our love to determine if it will bring fulfillment or detriment to our lives. We need to look at what's the motivation. And I'm going to take a quick overview of the life of a man in the 11th century. His name was Bernardo, or Bernard of Clairvaux. And that's, he became a saint. That's where we got St. Bernard from. And he talked about these four degrees of love. And this is called, you know, maturing love. What are the maturity levels of love? And I'm going to go through it very quickly. Number one, we love self for our self's sake. He said, humanity is born and our intrinsic uh, desire is to feed ourselves, to please ourselves, to satisfy ourselves. Every bit of our human instinct has this insatiable desire to look after themselves. And so we, he said that we would love ourselves for our own sake. So what happened next? He said, when people begin to recognize that they were growing up, they were doing everything for themselves, they still recognized they couldn't fulfill all their needs and all their desires in themselves. So they begin to look outside of themselves and they begin to look for somewhere else that they could get fulfillment. And that's when uh, people begin to love recognize that, oh, God is up there and God is good. But they were still selfish and they began to love God, not only because he gave them good things or he loved them just because he gave them good things. So he loved God for still for their own sake. And we see that in a lot of churches now. We see that in North America. People are still into just loving God for the sake of getting the benefits, getting healing, getting money, getting your needs met. And, and that's okay, but it's not where God wants to take us. And he said the third type of love is we love God for God's sake. What happened was they begin to uh, get their needs met. They begin to look outside and see God and see that he, they didn't want to love him just because he gave them good things. He, they wanted to love him because he was good. And they recognized it was the kindness of God that led to salvation. God is good. And as a result, we need to love him just because of his goodness. So first, they love themselves for their own sake. Next, they love God for their own sake. This third one was they begin to love God for God's sake. And that's where we enter into this really fulfilling experience that all of a sudden the old hymn, the things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and face. And there comes a time in your Christian walk that you begin to not focus so much on what's around you and what you need. This intimacy with the father, this understanding that you hear the voice of God, understanding that it doesn't matter what circumstances you find yourself in, God is with you and you find great fulfillment and great joy in this. This is a maturity that Clairvaux calls loving God for God's sake. When we enter in that position and we stay in that realm of maturity in love for some time, then God begins to see, show us who we are. And he begins to allow us to love ourself, but now it's for God's sake. So one of the things scripture says, you know, in this one, he said, you know, you're to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Many people don't know how to love themselves. Many people don't feel worthy to love themselves. All they can focus on is their shame and their guilt and their past. And God says, when you get close to me, when you get intimate with me, you will understand who I've created you to be. And you'll understand what I did for you. And when you understand that I gave it all up so you could be who I created you to be, you'll begin to love yourself. You'll begin to then reach out and love others for God's sake. So the ultimate goal is that we love God and we love ourselves so that we can love others in the way that he prescribed for us to love. 
God, Jesus said, we, we love God, or John said, because he first loved us. That's, that's, our, that's the catalyst. He loved us, and then we loved him back. So once we start to mature in love, that's when we can start to love others well. That's our goal, and that's where we're going. So let's shift gears. We're going to go back to Matthew 5, a quick overview, the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, last week we talked about, you know, um, you know, blessed is the peacemaker. Blessed is those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the, the, the rule of the kingdom that God said he brought to the earth that we were to embrace if we were going to advance the kingdom of God on the earth too. Now we're not preaching on Matthew uh, 5, 13 to 16, but that's where it says you're the salt of the earth and you're the light on the hill. And this is talking about our responsibility while we're waiting for the return of Christ. We're waiting for God to come back. We're, we're ruling and occupying this place. So Jesus comes again. He says, well, what are we supposed to do with the kingdom before it fully comes again? He said, well, you're supposed to occupy. You're supposed to be a light to people. You're supposed to be a salt. You're supposed to bring a difference to the world around you. You're supposed to do good work so people will see them and know and glorify your Father who's in heaven. But he also said to the, the, the Jewish people, Jesus said, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than that, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So here they were trying to keep all the commands, trying to do all the rules, right, to and to do everything. And Jesus just said, you just really can't. Unless you're better than them, you're never going to be able to keep it. And that's what we recognize. We'll never be able to keep the law of God in our own strength. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit and yield to God. And that's what we'll be successful at doing then. So Jesus is trying to teach the responsibility to keep the spirit of law, not just the letter of the law. Jesus went on. He went after the heart. Remember, he said, blessed are the pure in heart. So we're picking up scripture today from Matthew 5, 27 to 32. We're talking about adultery and about divorce. I don't know. Uh, the teaching on adultery. Uh, one thing I want to point out, though, that Jesus, uh, these passages of scripture are response to the Pharisees talking. They were trying to trap Jesus. They were trying to catch him. They would break up the law and said, yeah, but Lord, can we do this? Can we do that? And it's quite interesting. They were just like a good accountant, you know, trying to find loopholes, trying to find another way to save you a couple bucks. A good accountant knows how to interpret the laws in such a way that it's going to be the maximum benefit to you. And that's what, that's what these guys were trying to do. They were trying to find a, just a couple ways that they could twist this law or change this law. And they weren't only doing that to set themselves free, but sometimes they were doing that to harm other people. So this teaching is in a response to that that attitude of the Pharisees. So teaching about adultery, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. Adultery is having sexual relations with somebody that's not your spouse, your wife or your husband. But I say anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye or your mind, even your good eye causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body then have your entire body thrown into hell and he goes on to say um and if your hand even your strong hand causes you to sin cut it off and throw it away for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your entire body to be thrown into hell okay it's pretty serious what he's talking about here in this teaching about adultery now he talks about divorce. He said, you have heard that the law says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Now, these are pretty uh, hard passages of scripture. I think we probably need to pray again. Lord Jesus, help us. This is rough stuff. The church has been having challenges with this their whole life. As a matter of fact, I spoke to a, a young man the other day and I asked him, he'd went to Bible college. He'd been there for um, you know a full term at Bible college. And I said, are, are you ordained? And he said, actually, no. He said, I, I, um, I got a divorce right as I was finishing Bible school. And he said, so they wouldn't ordain me. This was several years ago. And so the, the conditions are changing as people understand Scripture better and what the Lord meant by this. Remember, Jesus is speaking to people that are looking for loopholes. They're looking to find ways around. So number one, he deals with lust. Jesus equates lustful desire as well as the act of sinning as sin. 
He said, it's not just breaking the rule. If you've got the sin in your heart, that's just as bad as anything else. He said, uh, that's why he came. He came to abolish the law. He came and embodied the law and fulfilled the law, right? And uh, we must deal with the spirit of the law as well. I, I don't know where I got this definition, but I love it that lust is doing something for yourself at the expense of someone else. But love is doing something for someone else at your very own expense. So lust is when you're trying to get something from someone and it's going to cost them their dignity. It's going to cost them finances. It's going to cost them something. That's what lust is. You're, you're trying to get something from them for yourself. You're trying to satisfy yourself. James 1 said lust starts a deadly chain reaction. James 1, 13 to 18, I won't read it all, but he says, God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires or our own lust, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So lust is never good. It's always going to cause you spiritual death. And that's why Jesus is bringing it up. Man, you need to do something serious to deal with this lust in your heart or this uh, physical actions. It's not merely enough to stop breaking the law of God. Breakthrough requires a higher standard of not even entertaining these lustful thoughts in your heart. All right? So the action. Now, if the desire to sin is sin, then the action of sinning certainly is sin as well. And um, he said, if your eye and your hand cause you to sin, gouge it out or cut it off. And this is a pretty crazy, you know, when you're a Bible believer and you say, Jesus, wow, this is like, he really said that. He said, take your eye out. He said, it's better that you go to, go to heaven with one eye and one hand or one leg or whatever. Um, then, then, you know, you go into hell with, with all your parts, right? In, in, uh, Bonhoeffer, I, I referred to that book last week, The Cost of Discipleship. He had a, he had a different approach. Like we got to deal with this kind of this self-mutilation. In no way do I believe that God says you're to do that. Okay, so uh, there's many Bible uh, commentaries that say, no, uh, Jesus did not mean to literally do that. Bonhoeffer actually said, if you're a disciple of Jesus and he said to do that, it's pretty clear that you kind of need to be that aggressive. Now, he, he stopped without saying do that, but he's saying that's how aggressive you need to be in dealing with your sin because it's destroying your life. It's destroying your relationships. It's destroying your hope. It's destroying your joy. It's destroying that abundant life that he gave you. So he said, we've got to obey Christ. Another thing he said is when you entertain sin in your mind, then you're, you're not free to dream and, and envision what God's got for you. You're not, you're not free to, to uh, wonder of uh, God and, and all the innovation that he wants to bring to the world possibly through you. So if your mind's tied up with thinking of lustful things or watching lustful things or, or, or just preoccupied with things that are just satisfying your flesh and your soul, it's, you're not open to getting the kingdom of God flowing in your mind and flowing through your life. Same thing with your hands. When you're dealing with things, when you're sinning with your hands, when you're involved in sexual sin with your hands, things like that, your hands aren't available to be doing the things God needs you to do in the world and around you. So the point is this, that the heart's desire and the act of sin are both serious. And as an all-in follower of Jesus Christ, we must get as far away from sin as possible. We must just deal with it aggressively. We must radically deal with it aggressively, boldly, get away from sin. That's what he's saying. Let's go to divorce, number three. Well, Jesus allows divorce here, but not in the hard-hearted way that the law had always been interpreted, that a man could uh, actually divorce his wife for just about anything. I was looking, there were several different school of thought in the different rabbinical schools, rabbis, and, and some said, well, you know, you could even, you could divorce your wife at that time if you found one fairer than she. So you found another uh, young maiden a little less uh, a little more attractive than your wife, you could just say, hey, divorce is coming. And that's what they did. Just take on another wife because, uh, you know, let's just face it. We get a little older. We get a little wrinklier. I don't know. You judge for yourself. Anyways, the, um, he also said, you know, you can actually, you can actually divorce your wife if, if uh, she feeds you a bad meal. Now, I don't know about you, but there, there'd be some people not... Uh, their marriage wouldn't last very long if it was just a bad meal that caused the, the breakup of the marriage, right? So Jesus is saying, this is silly, okay? He instituted uh, marriage 
to be a representation of Jesus loving the church. The institution of marriage is the foundational institution of the entire world. He, he gave that to people at the very beginning. Man would leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they would become one. And he said, what man has put together, let no man rip apart. And so when you rip apart a marriage, there's actually so much more happening than just the two entities separating. And uh, I read a good um, book well, years ago now. It was called The uh, Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. It was this 25-year study of divorce in Canada. And this came out in 2005 or 2006. But I'm sure the results are just exponentially worse than they are, were then said one of the worst things you can do as a as a couple that gets divorced um is is speak harmfully about your former spouse you know your wife or your husband so that just destroys children when you do that and and so when we look at at divorce uh we recognize that Jesus said that it is permissible but it's under only certain circumstances okay it's it's clearly allowed uh, Jesus replied in verse 8, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. They weren't honoring the marriage covenant and disrespecting the institution. And as a result, their hearts were getting hard. And uh, it's very, very important to honor God and the marriage that he's given you. And if uh, something's happened in your circumstances that you're no longer married, we need to just address the Lord. We need to acknowledge what God says about divorce and ask for forgiveness, ask for cleansing, ask for healing in your heart. May not have been your fault, may have been somebody else's fault, but God will come and he'll cleanse and he'll restore and he'll give you a new, fresh heart again. Another reason divorce was allowed for reasons uh, such as desertion. If you've been deserted by your spouse and and after you know, trying to find them and trying to be reconciled, uh, they don't come back, that God would allow for you to um, be divorced. Also, for prolonged abuse, if, if you've been abused, your family's been abused and you've, you've tried to get help, you've tried to go and get support, uh, God clearly doesn't want you to stay in that harmful relationship. But he wants us to not take marriage lightly. It is so serious. It's so important. Um, I mean, I haven't, I've said this many times before. I didn't ask Kathy if I could say it today, but hi, Kathy, you're probably going to get this tomorrow morning at about 10. Um, you know, I was very clear after my parents divorced that I knew that I was going to be married and I would have a successful marriage. And uh, that sounds arrogant to say, but I just knew if it had anything to do with me that love is a decision. If I decide to love and I decide to commit and I decide to serve and I decide to do things the way the word of God tells me to do, my marriage will be successful. Now, I must thank God that my wife has been gracious and merciful to me. And more than one time, uh, Kathy might have left and, and I wouldn't have blamed her. But by the grace of God, we stayed married. And, and I just thank God. And I want to encourage you right now, if you're having challenges in your marriage right now, just draw on to God. Just draw on to him. Draw into your wife, your husband. Just say, we need God to help us in this time. And he will see you through. I promise you, he will see you through. So the bottom is, line is that Jesus highly values marriage because he created it. He uses it to demonstrate Jesus' love for the church. It's a covenant not to be entered into lightly. He made that the first covenant. Um, he protected this covenant here, and his teaching is to tell us to make every attempt to restore and bring reconciliation to those relationships that you have. All right? So Jesus knows that the divorce has a high price, and I already talked about that. Um, the high price on children, the high price on on people when they when they um, they fear will I be able to will I be able to love again or can I get over what's wrong with me that caused this divorce and and so there's lots of reasons why you don't want to get divorced but if you have divorce as I said before God will restore you to wholeness God will help you because he's a redeemer he's a comforter and he's a friend he's not giving judgment to you right now he loves you he's not trying to put guilt on you right now he's just trying to say hey there's hope for you and me today. So the response of Jesus is clearly, clearly always lift up the downcast, the downtrodden, always lift up the, the depowered. He defended women who were being abused. He responded in grace to the woman caught in adultery. And he always releases folks into complete freedom. 
doesn't matter where you are today, doesn't matter what you've done or what your background is, Jesus wants to come into your life, set you free from anything that's holding you back from the freedom he died to give you. That's good news today. So a breakthrough of the kingdom and love means a breakthrough of how people keep covenant, how people treat women, how they treat children, how they uh, bring justice into the world. That's what a breakthrough of the kingdom of God is. That's what a breakthrough of love is. How do we manifest that in the world around us? So applying these important teachings of Jesus today, what are some of the things we can, we can do? Um, we must obey. The first thing was we must run from sin. He said, scripture says, flee youthful lust. I mean, have some strategies in your life. You know, if uh, if you've got a lust problem, you don't want to, you know, and the boys go play hockey and they're going down to the, the club or strip joint for a couple of beers. Like, that's just not a healthy place to hang out. You know, if you go to a bunch of place where there's a, it's, it's known as a singles bar and you've got a problem with, you know, wandering eyes, you just don't go there, right? So be wise with um, how you live your life, okay? Find an accountability partner. Find a person that you can trust, that you can share your heart with. I so respect, I know different men and women that have shared their struggles with me and um, and they've said they've, they've hooked up to a, a, you know, an internet service or an app that if they go to a certain website, say it's a pornographic website or something, I'll get an email that they've been there. And so that's an accountability partner. It's setting up good boundaries around your life. Remember we started in Genesis, boundaries bring health to your relationship that you can celebrate. So an accountability partner. Jesus responded with truth. He said, accept what you're doing is wrong and confess it to God. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to rationalize it. Don't try to say that's the world we live in. Acknowledge what the word of God said is sin is sin is sin. Confess it to God, bring it into the light, expose it, and you'll have victory over it every time. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Man, if you have any sin in your life, have a, a, a friend, a brother or sister that you can share with, an accountability partner. And as you share with, they can encourage you and strengthen you. Keep coming from, keep coming to church. Keep gathering together with other Christians, even all you feel miserable. You walk into that room, the first song starts. And I know I've been there dozens of times. If these people ever knew what I was into the last half a day, they would just think I was the worst person in the world. I know you can feel like that. Look, the way I just spoke to my kids, man, I just like so wicked to my kids. And you just feel like, oh, I, can't, I can't go anywhere near the church. No, the church is an oasis of God's love. It's an oasis of God's acceptance. We all know that God wants to love people and nurture us back to health. So we need to come. Don't hide from church. Don't hide from gathering together because that's the very thing that you need. We must take steps uh, to ensure we obliterate it from our life. Memorize scripture that deals with your sin. If you've got a problem with this or that or the other thing, go into the concordance, Google it. How do I deal with this sin? And there'll be all sorts of scriptures pop up. Hide them in your heart, scripture says, that you will not sin against God. All of a sudden, you'll be tempted to go do something. You'll be tempted to go do this. And all of a sudden, this word will pop in your mind. You know, thou shalt not put any unholy thing before your eyes. Oh, yeah, Jesus, thank you. You know, you know, if you want to watch violent TV shows, you know, the Lord hates violence, right? Those that love violence, the Lord hates, Scripture says. I said, wow, man, that's a good conviction. You know, the Spirit of God comes on you and, and uses that sword. That'll, that'll turn you around pretty quick. That'll turn the channel pretty quick, right? And we watch Toronto and Montreal go at it. How'd they do last night? Anyways, I wonder. Anyways, um, you know, if sexual sin is a problem, if there's a dysfunction in your home uh, sexually, couples, I encourage you to remember what the scripture says. Your body's not your own. It's uh, you need to be faithful to scripture, whether you feel like it or not. And that's important for your marriage. And uh, it's important for your spouse. And, and every act of obedience to the word of God looses more grace into your life. So, you may not feel like this or that or the other thing. You may not feel like going for a walk with your wife. But I tell you, that act of uh, serving her and caring for her will loosen up grace in another area of your life. So I encourage you, if the word of God says something, do whatever you can to obey it and watch what God does as a result of your obedience, right? Another big thing, fight shame. There's no condemnation, just conviction. Uh, it's the devil that comes. He's the accuser of the brethren. He comes and tells you, you did this, you did that. He tries to make you feel bad. And uh, I love the old saying, the old preacher, I know it's an old 
preacher, he said, if the devil starts remem- reminding you of your past, you start reminding him of his future. You know, he's going to be thrown in that scene. And uh, you got to remember that, that uh, God brings conviction. He reminds you. He whispers, you don't want to do that. You know what that's going to happen if you do that. It's conviction. He convicts you of your sin. So you'll come back to Jesus and repent and get forgiveness. Shame and guilt, on the other hand, they are something you need to deal with very quickly. Um, You need to trust him with your guilt and shame. You need to trust him to uh, restore you into relationship with him as a son, as a daughter. He loves to bring you in close. He loves to bring you back. There's good resources like Focus on the Family and other websites that have material and studies to help you with your areas of intimacy, uh, areas of relationships. There's so many good sites. I so appreciate Focus on the Family in Canada and the United States. They really go all out. Right now, uh, Kathy's just finished a six-part series on relationships. Man, it's free. They put it out free. Excellent teaching. I encourage you, hey, do something good for your marriage. Do something good for your home. And just check that out one night yourself. Go go take this little course. I want to talk to single people here for a minute. If you want a spouse, I know there's a lot of people. Last night when I sent the email out, some people said, uh, you know, you're really talking my language because there's people that are married. And Valentine's Day, we don't usually talk about singles, but single people uh, need encouragement. And I just want to encourage those that are looking for a spouse. You know, God wants you to be complete. God said it's okay if you live alone, a single life and serve him, serve the kingdom of God. But if you want a spouse, I encourage you to ask God and do not waver. Do not hesitate. Do not waver. Okay, Jesus, the disciples started to follow him and uh, he just turned and he said, what do you want? And they began to say what what they want. Jesus is asking you today, if you want a spouse, begin to ask the Lord, I want a spouse. Begin to prepare yourself, prepare your heart to be a good man or a good woman of God. How will you treat this woman when she comes? How are you preparing your life so that you will be a blessing to her, that you'll be able to love her the way Jesus loved the church? Begin to walk in faith towards that. Don't sit back and say, God isn't bringing me a wife. Oh my goodness, what's he going to do? Begin to walk in faith. Say, God, I want a wife. I believe for a wife. You said it's a good thing. It's not good for a man to be alone, he said. So ask him for a wife and do not waver and watch what the Lord will do. Believe for him. And the final thing we want to ask the Lord today is how, uh, God, will you, will you help us learn to love well? Um, will you help us not be selfish looking out for ourselves? Um, Just say, God, would you help us learn to be a person that's a giver? We'd be generous. We'll be kind. We'll be yielding of our lives for the benefit of those around us. Well, finally, what happens when we live free of shame? I was a victim of uh, sexual assault. I know I've told a couple of people this story before, but uh, different times in my life, there was a sexual assault as a young man. And, and something happens to people when they're sexually assaulted. If it's a circumstance that you can't really disclose it or bring it forward for whatever reasons, it's a prolonged abuse. You can begin to feel very much shame, very much guilt, very much um, that you've deserved it, that you wanted it, that you even liked it. And this cloak of darkness and discouragement can come over you. This real guilt and shame can come on your life. And I tell you, God wants us to learn to deal with that. And, and uh, you know, self-esteem is so poor. And, and God says, if you learn to deal with that, and I tell you, one day I got a hold of that scripture, said Romans 8, and you know, I quote it just about every second sermon. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh or after the law, but after the spirit. He said, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Shame has no place in your life. Shame cannot hold you down. He says, come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of his love. I love that song we sang. Shame has no place in your life and just begin to fight against it. Begin to reject it. Begin to tell an accountability partner I'm suffering with shame I'm suffering with this thing and confess it I've seen people come through freedom sessions completely free of circumstances and things they did in their past that caused them to be bound and caused them to feel awful their entire life today God wants you to step out of that shame step out of that dark just as you are into the fullness of God's love he loves you today 
Right now, I want to encourage you to reach out to Jesus and say, I need your help. Father, I want to live in this fullness of love. I want to be free from my dark past. I want to be free from my guilt, my shame, the stupid things I've done as a young man or a woman. I'm going to pray, and you just pray right after me and invite Jesus to come into your life and wash you clean from all that junk from your past. Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you that you died on the cross to release me from guilt, to release me from shame, to release me from sin that brings that on my life. I invite you into my life now to set me free, completely free, so that I can live for you, I can rejoice in you, I can love you, I can love myself, and I can love those around me. God, come today, I surrender. I bow my heart to you. Come in now, I pray, in Jesus' name. I tell you, you can trust him. Can he trust you as a church, all nations? Can we, when we start to meet again, can we create an oasis of love? a place where people can come in with their brokenness, their disappointment, their frustrations, the, the, the accusations that they've received by spiritual, well-minded, maybe spiritual people that, that kind of look down on them. Can we create our house, a house of acceptance, a house of freedom, a house of peace? Would people be comfortable to come up with you and say, I'm a sinner, I need help? That's the kind of place God wants us to have at All Nations, a place that welcomes people and will pray with them, not ignore their sin, not uh, say, I don't care about their sin, acknowledge their sin, teach them how to step right and get right with God. That's what God calls us to be. That's what we're going to do together as we link arms and allow Jesus' love to flow through our lives. Happy Valentine's Day, All Nations Church. Share this message with somebody. God doesn't want you bound. God wants you free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm going to just say a benediction right now. But first, I want to make sure that if you have a marriage, I want to encourage you right now to lean back into that marriage. I tell you, you get 38 years old, you get to just kind of live. Your wife is working at the other side of the house. You're working at this side of the house. It's all good. You love each other. But I tell you, God doesn't want you to have a mediocre marriage. He wants you to have an abundant life marriage. He wants you to have a great sex life. He wants you to have great communication. He wants you to have a great relationship with your kids. He wants you to be a beacon of light and hope to those that are struggling. And I tell you right now, my friends, recommit to a life of marriage the way God designed it to be and watch the blessing of God come on you. Let me pray for you now the blessing. May the love of Almighty God May the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of Jesus, and may the comfort and wholeness and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always until we meet again. God bless you. Happy Valentine's Day. We'll see you soon.
so, so good. So good. Well, happy Valentine's again, and what a, what a it was a big talk. We're talking about divorce and lust and crazy stuff, where, you know, on Valentine's, but I think it's it's huge. Uh, I, I, it reminds me, it doesn't even remind me, it just, it hit me as we were, as we were talking and speaking, that of when I was courting my wife, I kind of feel weird actually saying courting, um, but... When I was trying to Are you date. sure you weren't dating? Well, I was dating. I was, okay. I was dating. I was dating. I, was dating. <laughs> I just like the word courting. It sounds cool. Okay, let's we'll stick with courting. Okay. Stick with courting. So, I was courting my wife, but we're in a, we're in a spot where, um, you know, I, I'm okay. Like I, I'm an average guy, uh, you know. I, uh, but I, like I'm trying to marry this girl way above my class. <laughs> like it's true, way, true. Way above my class. <laughs> and so, I was gonna willing to do anything. And so as I'm listening to the sermon, and he's talking about lust, and he's talking about how. You know, you're lusting after something that, you know, it's selfish, you know, and, and you're taking away from somebody else. And I, I remember a time, because uh, it came up in counseling, honestly, uh, that uh, I made a promise that, you know, when she was coming up to Fort McMurray, she, we were going to stay uh, for three years, and then we're going to move back to a farm. How long have you been here? Uh, she's been here for now 12. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so funny that that, at the time, I did not not mean it. I just... I would say anything to have her. And so I didn't trust God at that time that it would work out. I was like, it was all in whatever I could do. And so for me, I was like, yeah, three years, no problem. We're out of here. Farm, I'm in. And then as time passed, she held on to that promise. I forgot about it instantly because I was, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. I, I wanted to do it, but then life carried on and everything went on and that, that promise was broken. And I didn't ever think about it. And as it came on, and as our love matured, there was that peace there that just, we couldn't break that barrier. And we didn't know what it was. And so through counseling and help and, and movement, we got to that point where we had to readdress my promise to her. And bring it into the open, right? Yeah, I, I, had to, I had to readdress that because I had made a commitment to her without any real thought of, moving forward on it and so I had to go back and I had to ask for forgiveness and I had to ask for forgiveness from her and I had to ask for forgiveness from God that I was taking his place and not trying to illustrate something myself instead of giving it to him and that was massive and I've learned that as as Pastor Rick talked today about the maturity of love and the maturity of the relationship our the growth in our relationship since I had to let that go it's a blessing, man. Yeah. It's a it it was a it's been a blessing. Our, our our marriage has flourished over something that I didn't even realize that I had said way back then. Mm -hmm. It was such a barrier. And when I could release that, I could live in truth. Yep. Because it was I, I still struggle to say it was a lie. Because in the moment it wasn't about Siri doesn't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> but um it, it wasn't it, to me it wasn't a lie, it just wasn't the truth. Yeah. Like I, I had, I had no hard evidence to be like, I'm actually going after this and going to give it to you. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yeah. she forgave me. Yeah. Um, I asked for forgiveness from God and we moved on and what, what a different level we were at. Yeah. And so yeah. it was, it was insane. That's so good, Stu. Shame, shame tells us to hide, right? Shame says, let's not, we're not going to talk about this. This doesn't matter. We'll just, it's just a secret here. Yeah. And, uh, you bring that into the open and, and deal with it together. And, uh, and that's what God does, right? Restores yeah. and, and lets you hopefully forgive yourself. <laughs> that's the hardest part. That's, Let's a, go. that's the Let's hardest go, part. That, yeah, it, that is the hardest part. So if you're out there today and, and, and there's something going on in your heart that you need help with prayer or you need help with forgiveness, um, you're struggling, you don't know how to take that next step, reach out to us. Um, you know, you can connect with us, obviously, on any of the social media platforms, Facebook, um, Instagram, on YouTube. Uh, always also hit us up at the website. We've got a comment card, uh, www.allnations.co. Uh, put your prayer requests in there. We will reach out to you. We, will, we want to pray with you. It's not that we will. We want to. We want to connect with you. This is a community. God has asked us to be in community, and we want to connect with you. Yeah, that's so good. Listen, if you... Uh, want we're going to be available to meet with you in person over zoom at 11 o'clock that's real soon 10 15 minutes from now 
Uh, we'll put the link in the chats on YouTube, on Facebook. We'll post it there. It'll be on the website. Hit that link. Jump in. You can come to uh, Next Steps. We're going to talk Next Steps 1 and 2. Talk a little bit about the culture of All Nations Church, what we're building here in Fort McMurray and reaching out with. And But listen, if you need to talk, I'm going to be there. I'll talk to you, man. We'll kick everybody else out, and uh, and we can have a discussion. We need to. We want to do that. So uh, please come join us. If you haven't met Pastor Eric, he will kick everybody out to have the conversation. He's passionate about it. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to everybody um, out there as we've come so far in the last five months that we could have not done it alone. Um, we're excited. We're going to be meeting in person soon. I just, I'm praying for it. I know it. Uh, there's so much going on. And I, again, I want to say thank you to all the people that put in their time, their energy, and their money into this church and this community. It is It is brought so much of the glory of God down. And so again, if you feel it on your heart to continue to give and to continue to help us, um, please, there's many ways to give. Uh, you can't do it in person anymore. Uh, you can come down and try to break down our doors, but we're not ready to go in person. So you're going to have to do it online. You can you can do it on our website. Bro, or, we're re- hang on. We're ready. We're we, ready. Just, we just can't yet. Right, we're right, ready. Right. Okay. We're, we're ready. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, or you can text to give. Um, I love text to give. It's easy. I can do it from my couch. Uh, I don't have to leave my wife on Valentine's to do it. So that's my favorite one. So, but yeah, go away today. Uh, again, hug your spouse. Give somebody a call. Uh, or hit us up in the chat, and uh, we love you guys. Happy Valentine's. Yeah, love we you. love you. See Thank ya. You.